Marin Katusa's new book, The Colder War, is now on bookshelves. Marin pulls away the curtain on how Russia, China, and Iran have come to dominate the global energy stage and put the petrodollar to rest once and for all. Find out why Dr. Ron Paul and critics alike are calling The Colder War one of the most important books you will read this year. Visit palisaderadio.com and enter our weekly drawing to win a free signed copy of Marin's book. That's palisaderadio.com. This is Palisade Radio, and I'm your host, Colin Cattell. Today, we're talking with Nick Jambruno, senior editor of Doug Casey's International Man. Internationalman.com provides valuable information for investors looking to diversify assets and political risk. Nick, welcome to the program. Hey, thanks, Colin. Can you give us a little background on Internationalman.com, maybe starting back at Doug Casey's best selling book? Oh, certainly. That's where uh, the website has its roots, is Doug Casey's uh, book uh, of the same name, International Man. It was published in the late 70s. Uh, And this book talks about how you can dilute your political risk through diversifying different aspects of your life internationally. And what that does is it makes it very difficult for any government or any group of politicians to control your destiny. It really allows you to live uh, a much freer life and uh, makes it so your destiny isn't held hostage by any particular nation, state, or government. So that book came out in the late uh, 1970s. It was a best-selling book. talked about how you can uh, move some of your money internationally, obtain different citizenships, move your business internationally, and so forth. And when you do all of these things, you what you, in effect, do is you diversify your sovereign risk or your political risk, which is, you know, the risk that comes from your home government. And really, it's not that different than, uh, like, say, mitigating your portfolio risk. Like, you know, if you hold a portfolio of diversified assets, you know, stocks, bonds, real estate, metals, and so forth, you diversify the risk of the overall portfolio because your asset classes are diversified. In the same sense, you can diversify your, your, uh, your political risk and really, you know, mitigate it away when you diversify different aspects of your life abroad. So that was the central theme of Doug's book. And obviously that came out before the internet. So it, uh, it got dated. And so that the website now takes that original mission of that book and puts a format that's easy to update. And, uh, because these things change really quickly, uh, obviously, and new opportunities arise and others disappear. So the website is a great, uh, vehicle for continuing the mission of that groundbreaking book. I'd be curious to know how you came to meet Doug Casey and got involved with the Casey Research Group. Yeah, it's it's an interesting story, actually. I met Doug, well, first I should say, I had been reading Doug's material for years, and I, I started out as a reader, and uh, I met Doug when we both happened to be in Beirut, Lebanon, uh, a few years back, actually I think it was back in 2010 or 2011, and he put out uh, just in one of his letters that, hey, I'm going to be in uh, Lebanon, are any of my readers in Lebanon would like to meet up, uh, just reply. So I replied and uh, got a chance to meet with Doug, and that meeting uh, eventually led to me taking on the role that I have now with uh, International Man and with Casey Research. Let's go over a few different diversification options for investors who are interested in mitigating their political risk. Let's start with uh, second passports. For the average U.S. citizen, Give us maybe the best two or three options and an explanation why we need a second passport. Okay, sure. Uh, I'll start with why you need a second passport because then you know we can uh, better understand the reasons why you'd want to go through the trouble to get one. Uh, the, the reason you'd get one is, is, like we were saying before, about diversifying your political risk. When you have another passport, you have more options. It gives you the options to bank, to live to work, uh, you know, to do business in countries that you previously couldn't. I, for example, am a dual American-Italian citizen, and that gives me the legal right to live and work in the EU countries. It also opens doors if I, uh, you know, want to work internationally in other countries or do business or bank in other countries where it's increasingly difficult as an American. But the point is, is that a second passport is not just prudent for Americans, it's prudent for anybody in the world to get because it, it makes it so that you're not tethered uh, completely to one country. And that, that is the main benefit. And it's also important to understand, too, that your passport and your citizenship, that doesn't really belong to you. 
the government owns it, and they can take it away at a moment's notice for any reason uh, they see fit. And that's not just the U.S. government. It's the Russian government, the Chinese government, the Bahraini government. Uh, any government can do that. So when you have uh, multiple passports, what you're really doing is diluting the power that the politicians in your home country wield over you. So those are some of the reasons. They're not all the reasons. They're just you know some of the most prominent ones of why you would want a second passport. Now, to get a second passport, it's not not necessarily the most easy thing in the world to do. And there is no solution that is at the same time cheap, fast, legitimate, and easy. Uh, it just doesn't exist. Um, now, that being said, it's this is a very individualized thing. So there's not, uh, you know, you have to look at some of these individual circumstances to determine where is what is the best path to take towards the second passport. Now, the easiest path relative, in, in, relatively uh, speaking, is to get it through an ancestry program. Now, there's a number of countries around the world that offer uh, citizenship by ancestry. So if you have, like, for example, for me, I have Italian heritage, and I was able to claim Italian citizenship that way. Now, if you're lucky enough to have uh, heritage in one of these countries, mo most notably Italy, Ireland, Spain, and a few others in Europe, uh, they, that is the relatively easiest way to get a second passport. Now, if you don't, if you're not lucky enough to have uh, ancestry in one of those countries, uh, the next easiest route is to do the economic citizenship programs. Now, these are not cheap; these are expensive. The, the most, uh, the cheapest one costs about one hundred and thirty thousand dollars per uh, per per individual. I guess you get so you get some discounts if you have you know spouse and kids, but about one hundred and thirty thousand dollars all in with you know legal fees and so forth and. That's with an island in the Caribbean. Um, so that's the minimum you're looking at to do these economic citizenship programs. That's the next easiest route. The, the next one would be if you're willing to do some sort of extraordinary circumstance, like you're willing to marry a foreigner, you're willing to adopt a foreign child, you're willing to serve in a foreign military. Most people aren't willing to go to those lengths to get citizenship, but it certainly is an option if, if, you, if you want uh, and the last way to do it, and, and this is sort of the old-fashioned way, is to just become naturalized after spending a certain amount of time being a, a permanent resident of the country. And that's generally going to take you, at the best case, four to five years. So those are, those are the different routes to a second passport. None of them are particularly easy unless you have the ancestry. But it doesn't uh, negate the need to do it, especially given the political dynamics uh, we see in the U.S. in particular and around the world in general. Okay, and then offshore gold storage, the case for confiscation is strong enough to merit American citizens considering offshore jurisdictions for holding their gold. What are the maybe two or three best jurisdictions that you would consider to purchase and or hold the metal? I think my my personally my favorite jurisdiction is Singapore, uh, just because it's an it's 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 has an arm's length uh, distance between them and uh, the U.S. government, and you know as an American that's a, you know it's important because we were talking about before about diluting your political risks. So when you want to do that, it's in the same sense that you want to hold different assets that are uncorrelated in your portfolio. Uh, you want to do the same with your political risks. So you want to diversify different aspects of your life, like gold storage, for example, among countries that are not uh, correlated with your home country. So Singapore is a good one. Hong Kong is a good one, too. I, I particularly like Hong Kong because it ha it's part of China, and it has China in its corner. And that really, really insulates it uh, from U.S. pressure that any other country you know, maybe short of Russia, but not Russia is not a good place to store your gold. Hong Kong is also, you know, has more of you know a free market history uh, and, and and so forth in history of property rights than other parts of of China. So that that it kind of has that dual feature, which is nice. It has that, and then it also has China in its corner, which means it's not easy to bully or push around. So Hong Kong and Singapore are my two favorites. A lot of people don't realize the flexibility afforded by an IRA. Uh, you can actually set an IRA up as an offshore entity and then hold things like metal and real estate offshore through that IRA. Can you touch on that quickly? Oh, certainly. And I, this goes back to your question about confiscation, because if there is an order for gold confiscation, I believe that it's not going to come like a 1930 style gold confiscation. It's just the fact is that not many Americans own physical gold as a percentage of the population. 
And so it wouldn't really be worth the government's efforts to do that. I, I think what they would do more likely is to do a windfall profits tax on gold and just say, hey, when you sell your gold, you're going to pay 90% uh, uh, of your gain in profit, uh, excuse me, 90% of your gain in taxes. So they can do something like that. There's precedent for that. So I think the most likely form of gold confiscation in the future will come as a windfall profits tax. Now, the way you protect yourself against that, and you know, we can't be sure of anything, but uh, uh, the way you can do it now is to put your gold in a Roth IRA. Because when you put it in a Roth IRA, you're using after-tax funds uh, to fund that IRA, and then any subsequent gain that's inside the IRA is tax-free, given the current rules. Now, they could always monkey with the, the IRA rules, but I think that would uh, produce a lot of kicking and screaming from a lot of angry voters, uh, people of voting age. So I don't think they would likely do that. Another option would be to renounce your U.S. citizenship, which is a pretty drastic uh, measure. So I think the most practical way to protect yourself from confiscation is to put it in an IRA and then take that IRA uh, and then you can, excuse me, take the gold that's in that IRA and you can hold it offshore in physical form. Uh, that's called a self-directed IRA. And uh, we talk more about that, uh, the nuts and bolts of it on, on the International Man site. But I think that's uh, the one of the best ways that you can protect yourself without short of taking the drastic step of renouncing your US citizenship. What about banking options with FATCA in place? The US government knows how much you put in each account regardless of where it's domiciled. What's the benefit at this point to pursuing offshore banking and where would you look to do it? Sure. Well, offshore banking uh y yes, that's true. Financial privacy is dead and there's a lot more benefits to financial excuse me, offshore banking than just financial privacy. Um, even if there wasn't FATCA and all of this ridiculous reporting requirements, the U.S. government can still do acts of subterfuge to access your accounts. For example, Edward Snowden was posted in Switzerland uh, before he uh, you know, became a whistleblower uh, with uh, the U.S. intelligence. And one of his goals or one of his missions was to get Swiss bankers in a compromised position so he could blackmail them to give him account secret account information. So even in the absence of FATCA, the U.S. government can do these things, and they could just hack into the computers of the bank they wanted uh, for the information from. They could also um, blackmail people uh, within the bank. You know, th this happened in Switzerland as well, where a former bank employee was given a certain amount of money to copy all the uh, client information, and then jump across the border to I think it was Germany. Uh, so even without FATCA, there are ways the governments can access your financial information. So the most prudent thing is, is to, uh, to assume financial privacy is dead. And it's not, an unfor you know, it's not a comforting thing. I, you know, I, it doesn't make me happy, but it's just you know, you got to not have your head in the sand and realize that it's dead. And unfortunately, it's never coming back. So, but that being said, there are still many solid reasons why you would want to consider banking outside of your home country, which is just offshore banking is just that. Just that. That's all it means is just having a bank account in a country where you don't live in. It's nothing. That's all it means. So what, what are some of the other benefits? Some of the other benefits are that if your money is, outs your money is outside of the immediate access of your home government. So for instance, in Cyprus, when they did their bail-in, if you were a Cypriot and you had your money not in a Cyprus bank, but in a Swiss bank or in a Panama bank or something like that, it would not have been hit with the capital controls. It would not have been hit with the billing or the stability levy or whatever euphemism they want to call that theft. Uh, so that is a big benefit is that it's outside of the immediate reach of, of, uh, of the politicians in your home country. And that gives you diversification benefits. Two is that uh, having... A lot of these banks in certain jurisdictions, certainly Hong Kong, Singapore, Switzerland, uh, and and a few others that come to mind, banks in these uh, Andorra, banks in these jurisdictions are extremely well capitalized and more stable than say the over leveraged uh, banks with all these hidden derivative bombs uh, that you find in the U.S. and in Western Europe. Uh, so those are a couple of reasons, solid reasons, why offshore banking is still important, despite the fact that financial privacy is dead in the water. You're closely tied in with the KC Research team. What are you and Doug and the rest of the team seeing for gold and silver short term and in the long term at this point? Well, in the short term, we see the potential for 
uh, a market uh, correction, a stock market correction, and that's going to drag down a lot of asset prices, uh, including gold and silver. So we see the potential for short-term weakness in gold and silver, but we think the response to that will be that the Fed uh, will have to back, will have to taper on its taper essentially, and we'll have we'll see like QE4 or QE or more QE, and that that will send gold higher in the long term. In the long term, yeah, we we are still our our long term outlook on gold is still very bullish, and the fundamentals um, are, are are still heavily uh, in favor of higher gold prices. So that hasn't changed. But our short term outlook. Uh, would be that you know there there is a very strong possibility for uh, market correction in in you know equity markets and that's going to drag down other asset prices but the inevitable central bank response is gonna is gonna uh, be bullish for for metal prices. Nick, some great points you've made today. Of course, this interview has given listeners a very basic overview of diversification strategies you've developed with Doug Casey, and tons more of that information can be found on internationalman.com. Nick, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Colin. Vladimir Putin is a self-made man. He did not come from money. He did not come from a royal family. He was your blue-collar boy who did well. Putin has positioned himself in the center of the chessboard in the energy matrix of the world. Right now, Putin and his allies in China, India, Brazil, all of the emerging markets are aligning together to fight the European Union, the IMF, and America. Eventually, the rest of the world will realize that Obama and America are hiding behind this curtain with no powers anymore. Putin specifically has positioned Russia to become a global superpower, and America has never been more vulnerable than it is today.